Do we have to film a review? Later! Did you ever do work? Later! <laughs> Not though. Don't you have videos to edit? Mm, later! Hello everyone and welcome back to the Neverland Book Club. Today we are discussing the newest Stephen King title and I can't believe this is my first official review on King but here we go. Later! The title that encompasses the one magical word for procrastinators everywhere. The one line fallback answer for all unfinished projects during the 11th hour before it's due. Why didn't you tell me I had crumbs all over my mouth? You know when you wake up from a dream about chocolate cake? A rich and decadent chocolate cake, perhaps with raspberries on top. You dream about it, you wake up, you go to work, and it's all you can think about. At lunch, your packed sandwich tastes like the chocolate cake. Your afternoon coffee, cake. You finally get off work, you go to the grocery store, you buy all the ingredients, you go home and bake your little butt off, and then, finally, the oven beeps, you're patient enough to let it cool. You take a bite and... Some Something's missing. It's good, it's chocolate cake. But it's not the cake of your dreams. It's not all you thought it could be. It's... It's just a chocolate cake. That's my analogy for finishing later. An experience which, by the last page, had me questioning if King actually ruined his own legacy with a certain and underwhelming big secret. A possible secret ingredient to his genius that almost ruins the whole recipe, therefore ruining all the cakes. As mentioned in my live stream with Bestie from the North, Stephen King is home for me. But this felt like a hotel. It was fun in a shallow way. After giving it more thought, I was actually a bit disappointed. It had some very common and familiar king tropes with the gifted child who was normally male, an interesting cop with some sort of vice, and at least one character in the library business. Literary. Literary business. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> the characters had some potential, but just when I thought something was going to get even more interesting, that chocolate cake just had a funny aftertaste. Let's start with a quick synopsis. We have a young boy, Jamie, with a very special ability to speak to the dead. Now, we all know this power can get quite boring when presented in the I see dead people type of way. That's where certain rules can make it more compelling. With Jamie, he can only see the dead for the first week or so in which they have died. Then they begin to fade. The dead also tend to blend in with everyday people standing on the street and always appear in the clothes they were wearing when they died. He uses this as one of the ways of determining the difference between living and dead. Also through body language and when he makes eye contact with them, they realize they're being seen. <laughs> Another alluring rule is actually hinted on the cover. Only the dead have no secrets. The dead people Jamie does have a chance to speak with cannot tell a lie. Any questions he asks, they are compelled to answer with nothing but the truth. Which, spoiler, can come in handy when talking to a recently deceased serial bomber. <laughs> And then throughout the story, he keeps hinting at a certain secret. <laughs> his mom's secret, the biggest secret that reveals perhaps why he has his gifts. Like, I'm telling you, the story had so much potential. It just... <sighs> it felt like King was perhaps writing many stories at the same time, which I'm pretty sure he's against. And kind of forgot about this one contract he had to write for this one. He needed to get a story out fast and just wrote this short 248 page novel overnight in his spooky pajamas with Molly aka the thing of evil by his side. If you don't know who I'm talking about, go follow King on Twitter. You won't regret it. I promise. Beside his occasional political rants, his Molly tweets are gold. Anyway, back to the story. It didn't feel like he gave as much thought to it as he clearly has in the past with other projects. The Institute, for example, comes to mind when I think about other recent stories he has written revolving around a young boy with special abilities. Although that one is not about the ability to speak to the dead, it feels like the main boy from later, Jamie, and the main boy from the Institute, Luke, are the exact same character. 
They're the same person with the same demeanor, the same personality, perhaps even the same language. I feel like if you were to swap out the two, minus their differences in abilities, you'd have the exact same story. Which actually might be by design. We all know King likes to hint at previous stories of his and develop parallel universes within his own lore, something which, as a constant reader, I appreciate immensely and makes me feel special when I catch them. That is, until I see what he was hinting at was quite obvious and is actually on the back of the book itself. The big bad in this story is it. Yeah. The It. Later is Stephen King at his finest, a terrifying and touching story of innocence lost and the trials that test our sense of right and wrong, which echoes of King's classic novel It. Later is a powerful, haunting, unforgettable exploration of what it takes to stand up to evil in all the faces it wears. Like a clown face. <laughs> the evil thing in the novel was incredibly nostalgic of It, and I felt that while reading, which made me excited to turn the page, but then... To see it on the back of the book just slapped on was kind of insulting. Like, let me have this as a fan. Let me realize these things for myself. Don't insult our intelligence by spelling things out for us. Like, I can read. <laughs> but still, with this title in particular as a constant reader, I had fun. I ate the cake. I just wasn't excited to tell everyone I knew to also eat the cake. Among the gripes I had for the story itself while reading, I felt like I kept catching typos, like it only went through one editing read-through, if that. Another recycled Easter egg which made me feel like King may have written this the night before it was due was the ritual of Chud. Chud? Chud? You know. The one from IT? I won't go too in-depth about the lore of this ritual and where it comes from, but the main gist is basically an arm wrestling fight with tongues. <laughs> and riddles, two entities, be it demon and human normally, engage in a battle of mercy. Or as kids, we might recognize it as say uncle. The two opponent you, you don't know, know say uncle? uncle? The two opponents bite down on each other's tongues and tell riddles. How? When their tongues are being bitten, I don't know. <laughs> the first to laugh loses. If the human loses, the monster consumes his soul. It's very... King. It appears first in the novel It, when the character Bill reads about it in Night's Truth in the Dairy Public Library. I am not too sure if this ritual is from actual folklore or just King's mind, so I'm not entirely sure who to give the credit to here. I also think it stems from many different cultures with different names for it, like the Boogeyman or El Kukui, etc. We all know King likes to take creatures and concepts from different cultures and spin them for his stories. With credit, I'll add. He never claims to have made them up himself. I believe he does always give credit where it is due in his novels. To any account, I do feel like in the masterpiece that is it, the concept was so well thought out and used in such a brilliant and useful way to the story. It was detrimental to the fate of the characters, but here, in later, it was a cloth just thrown in to try and clean up the story and make it somewhat presentable. Let's see, how can I quickly push out a story that is guaranteed to sell in a market of nostalgia and remakes? Hmm. Oh, I know. I'll use everything unoriginal to myself. I'll use concepts I've already used a hundred times and just regurgitate interesting concepts into 250 pages and it's guaranteed to sell because it has my name on it. <laughs> that name. That's at least what I imagine he may have been thinking and you know, I can't blame him. Imaginary King voice in my head is right. I bought it the day it came out without any knowledge of what the story is about or if I was going to like it or not, simply because it had his name on it. Anything with his name on it, I know I'll be loyal to and read because I am a fan. And because I am such a loyal fan, I will sometimes lie to myself and say I enjoyed something when perhaps I didn't. While reading, at first, I thought, wow, Oh my god, this is fantastic, this is great, another masterpiece, King, my king, you are superior. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. And then, it wasn't until afterwards when my mom asked what I was reading and I started describing the story, I realized all of the holes. I realized how, I'm sorry, but lazy the story was. Lazy to King, that is. Because lazy to one author, like King, could be ten years in the works for another. Which is something else I think we need to consider. The novel was not bad, not at all, but it was more so on the side of disappointing for a King read. And that's my point, thank you for coming to Productive Bailey. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I'm Elf Broke! When you think of other titles like Sleeping Beauties, The Langoliers, Shawshank Redemption, The Shining, Misery, God, the list goes on and on, you can't help but have a certain expectation for picking up another book by the same person that wrote all of those masterpieces. You expect the cake, the raspberries, the ganache, the thick and moist cake with the rich chocolate frosting, you know? The satisfaction! <sighs> The one thing I honestly did not see coming at all, and which actually made me dislike the book even further, was the big, long, anticipated twist in the end. The book is told from Jamie's perspective as an older man. How old? We don't know. That is not disclosed. We just know that it is told from a Jamie that has made peace with what happens in the story and who is on the other side of the trauma. He is telling it in a way that lets the reader know that all the secrets will be revealed in the end. Does that mean Jamie is now dead? Telling the truth as part of the rules of the story? Again, we don't know. But you know, I want to disclaim here spoilers, though, because it's such an underwhelming secret, I don't know if it would actually spoil anything. It has nothing to do with the story. It felt like an added little taboo quirk King decided to tack on the end. Like he was writing the whole thing without knowing himself what he wanted the big secret to be, and it's 11.59pm and he said, Ah, uh, I don't know, what if his uncle is actually his dad? <laughs> and incest is the answer to the shine! <laughs> what? I- <laughs> As a casual King reader, I can see someone being like, oh, how interesting, how cool, all these new concepts and rules and twists, wow. But as a King fanatic, I was disappointed. And so that brings me to my inevitable question. Who's this book for? I'd say non-King readers who want a taste of what it feels like to read King prose. Despite my complaints, it was still King. His language and vocabulary and cadence still flowed in a way that felt comfortable and familiar. The read-through still felt easy, in the same way re-watching your favorite movie for the 250th time is comforting and easy. So actually, even if you're a constant reader and everything I've just ranted about doesn't bother you, and you're just looking for the fun, rerun feel, sure, I'd say this is also for you. Because again, despite everything, I had fun. I enjoyed it. And perhaps I'm biased and can't ever admit to completely disliking a King book because of my irrational and far-fetched fear that he will magically somehow see this or hear of me, an ant in his big world, and dismiss me as a hater, which I know he probably won't. They say never meet your heroes, but if one day I do ever meet King, telling him I'm a big fan and love everything he's ever written will probably just be another Tuesday for him. But challenging his work and saying, yes, I'm a fan, but what if you did this, ho ho, I don't know. Again, I feel like an ant in his shadow, and he probably wouldn't even care about my opinion. And he wouldn't have to. He's Stephen King. And what am I even talking about? I don't, I don't know. I don't know how we got here. I'm gonna go ahead and end this video here before I fall into a well myself. <laughs> I'm such a fan. Thank you all so much for watching. Be sure to like this video if you liked it, and subscribe if you're not already. Fun fact, on my old, 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 old channel, when the 2019 remake of It first came out, I published the very first Neverland Book Club video titled Top 5 Stephen King Adaptations. My hair was short but still curly, and I had no idea how to take care of it. I lived in my parents' house, I was a biology student, Pablo and I were still together of course, and he was behind the camera for that video as well, but I had no idea if I would continue making videos about books. And here we are, you and I, sitting across from one another three years later on a channel that grew faster than I ever expected, so that younger Nadia thanks you, and so do I. <laughs> Today's shout out goes to Bilal Bekis. Thank you for being among my first 900 subscribers, and thank you for your optimistically hopeful words before your channel blows up. <laughs> I appreciate the positive vibes, so thank you. All right, I'm off to go scroll through King's Twitter feed under my bed and pre-order his future release without knowing anything about it. Such loyalty. Stay lost, keep reading, and remember, dead men tell no tales. Wait, that's the wrong franchise. Whatever. Bye!